And good morning, everyone. Um, I'm from EOS Positioning Systems, and we're based in Montreal, uh, suburb of Montreal. And EOS uh, specializes in the manufacturing and providing solutions for um, field data collection systems, Genesis receivers, high accuracy. Uh, the mandate of EOS was in the early days was to demystify the centimeter accuracy that scared a lot of people uh, in the field. They want to do it, but uh, can we can we do that? Is it affordable? Um, will we have the capabilities and the software, the knowledge it takes to do our own uh, field data collection system construction as built, all the workflows that are involved in there? And today we're going to just do a quick overview of in order to understand the why and how you can do it today is to take a travel uh, back in time to see where it all started and why you can do it today. And um, so the agenda is basically quickly the evolution of field data collection systems and why can we do it now and what is happening and you know all the changes happening in all the GPS, GNSS constellations and differential correction source also that we will um, quickly uh, talk about and some AC use cases before transitioning to Mike. So uh, the uh, field data collection systems all, always consist of three components, whether you have it all in your hand or whether it uses bits and pieces like a computer, uh, a Genesis receiver, and a software. These are the three main components uh, of what, com what makes a modern data collection system. In the old days, uh, this is what it looked like. Uh, you had bulky systems. For example, the first image is uh, all-in-one, where you have a DOS operating system, proprietary software, uh, GPS receiver, and then you have to collect your data. You have to post-process to get your accuracy uh, afterwards, after you go to the uh, after you come back from the field to the office. And you can never know where you are in the field. So in order to do stakeout, to go and take a design and put it in the field, you had to use a big backpack, uh, a very expensive system. And back, I, I would say, uh, in the early 90s, we're talking about probably 60 to $80,000 US dollars for a pair of centimeter accuracy receiver just using radios. And um, so, Today, what allows every, everybody in the industry to do field data collection system at one centimeter accuracy is a whole bunch of ingredients that came together almost at the same time. And we see, for example, yeah, well, I remember my old phone back in the 90s. It was about a one foot brick uh, cell phone with a big antenna and could work only where it could work and when it could work. And then the, 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 smart, the phones started to get smaller and smaller until they got smarter. And we can see the very first iPhones, for example, back in 2007 uh, here, and uh, the iPads followed, uh, I'm sorry, the tablets in general followed in the, about a few years from that, a few years ago. So all these devices in the field became smart. So, and you had uh, um, you had multiple vendors. We started BlackBerry, and then we had Android, and then Apple, and then we have Windows also uh, tablets that came out. And all these are competing in this world and trying to offer the best performance in the field. Basically, you take. I want to name names, but you take a tablet today, and is it as powerful as your desktop computer? It's heading there, but it is getting more and more powerful. And uh, also, on the satellite side, you we started with GPS, and I remember the old days back in the early 90s where you had to be in the field at 4 o'clock in the morning, watch a certain window of a certain number of time, a certain number of hours where you could be outside and doing field data collection system because you would only have four satellites available to do your data collection. And nowadays, not only GPS, which is a U.S. constellation of satellites, which has come to maturity to about 31 satellites today, we have seen other systems similar to GPS uh, from different countries around the world being launched. So we, after the US, there was GLONASS in Russia. 
and uh, after GLONASS, then Beidou started in China, and then we had Galileo in Europe. And these are all for global constellations. They have satellites orbiting around the world. And all these constellations make up the new name that they call GNSS, Global Navigation Satellite Systems. And you got some regional satellite constellations also. For example, in Japan, you got QZSS. And also in India, you got the RNRSS also uh, coming up. But these are mostly regional to those countries. And uh, if you subscribe to our newsletters uh, on, a mo on a monthly basis, we have uh, status of the GNSS constellations. And you can see here, you get a total of uh, op orbital, operational and orbital satellites today, 103 satellites, which is a long way from the five, six, or seven that we used to have in GPS. And uh, it means, what does it mean to you? It means that you have better productivity today, uh, less downtime in the field, and under foliage also you get more productivity. And also along with the GPS, you need, in order to get your accuracy, whether it's sub-meter or whether it's centimeter accuracy, you need a source of differential correction to correct those signals coming from very far, from 20,000 kilometers down to the antenna there are some errors and you need to correct for those errors and you have you have various types of sources one of them that has evolved a lot for submeter is the SBAS, space-based augmentation systems it started with the us with the faa um, and you have geostationary satellites broadcasting differential correction for a certain area so if you look at the blue on the left across north america covers from the northern part of colombia all the way to the Arctic, if you want, and this are this is a coverage area for was, and the three geostationary satellites that you have both casting correction. So your your receiver is not only able to compute a location, but also receive those signals on the same antenna and provide you with submeter accuracy. And you have other systems that followed up. Uh, they were mainly made for aviation at the beginning, but now they're being used for ground users. And you have IGNOS in Europe which uh, followed, same principle. And then you got MSAS in Japan, you got Gagan, and now Australia is coming out with their, uh, with their test bed also. It was operational last year. They had to shut it down, and it's going to resume again uh, next year in, 20, in, in the fall, in the, maybe in the summer of 2021. And also you have proliferation of RTK networks all over, all over the world. Uh, and we're talking, if we take, for example, in the US, you got a whole bunch, every state basically is covered for an RTK network. Some of them are free operated, usually by DOT, Department of Transportation. New York, for example, is free, Florida is free. And you got other that are paid subscriptions. And in the case where the, you have multiple uh, receivers in the field and you need to have access to those RTK networks to go down to one centimeter accuracy, uh, in the case you have too many of those receivers, it's going to be and it's paid uh, for the state in which you are. There's also the possibility of adding your own base station, whether it's mobile, whether it's fixed. You can create your own base station uh, and broadcast over the internet and have your team of field data collection just use those signals and go down to one centimeter accuracy with the benefits of four constellations and all the new frequencies coming today. And uh, besides that, if you're in an area where there's poor cell coverage and you you have a project to work in some place in the world, let's say the desert somewhere where there's no differential correction available, more and more we're seeing paid satellite subscription services. For example, Atlas is one of them. And uh, you can just subscribe to the differential correction service via satellite and go down the decimeter to about four or five centimeter accuracy. So this is a proliferation of GLSS of handheld computers so far, of GPS or GNSS satellites in the sky and differential corrections for those satellites. And also software uh, with the, all those mobile devices, smart devices uh, coming on the market, people have started doing field data collection system. And they became easier because now that our GNSS receiver provides either submit or centimeter accuracy in real time, this goes in into any workflow. And we've seen an evolution also, and we're still seeing it today, an evolution of um, what we called uh, standalone data collection apps, where you just 
download your app, you put it on your device, you do your data, you do your data collection, and then you transfer to the office. And we've seen the migration from this to a workflow which is mainly cloud-based. For example, the ESRI software, where you are doing your work in the field and everything that you do in the field is already transferred back at the office and people can see live what you're doing. And uh, there's a lot of partners that we have on our website that, website that offer plenty of software suitable for different type of applications. And uh, the modern field data collection system, again, the three components, the computer, the software, and the GNSS receiver. It gives you flexibility of not getting stuck with an, with an outdated uh, operating system. And we know how fast this evolves. We know that, for example, all those Android devices coming up right now with Android 10, and we've got an old phone with Android 7, which is, and the software no longer support them, and you have to throw away your entire system if you have an all-in-one, because the software is no longer compatible with that. So keeping the system modular allows you to evolve in time. The GNSS receiver has all the constellations, the software will be updated, and you can change your mobile device as you wish. And the prices have tremendously go down also. And the, so we, we see here the benefits of the modular approach, and this boosts creativity and in turn, and we turn also boosts productivity in the field and gives you freedom to create your own based on your needs. And the other advancements also, especially for the AEC market, is where is that line between surveying and GIS? Uh, can the bridge between the, can, can, we, can we bridge the gap between the two? And this is where bringing high accuracy to people who have no knowledge of GNSS with minimal training and putting uh, all the tools, giving them all the tools that they need you know, to do the data collection in an easy manner in the field. So uh, EOS has a range of GNSS receivers from submeter all the way up to, to centimeter accuracy and using all the constellations available today for maximum productivity. And also the other solutions that we bring, uh, we bring three solutions to our users. One of them is extremely important, is the use of precise elevation. So the support for altometric heights is available in any software that you use. Uh, so our receivers provide, uh, for the US, for example, we cover Joey 12B, Joey 18 models, and this goes directly into your app. And other total station types, uh, survey types of workflow, for example, to mimic a total station where we have laser offset measurements that goes directly, for example, in this case, on RGIS and soon field maps, where you can make take offset measurements from afar, whether it's dangerous to occupy or whether it's, it's on the foliage and you'll be able to map with centimeter level those type of, of assets that are far. And an open trench, for example, is another uh, use case for the EOS laser offset. And we also have solutions for on the ground. Uh, people want to map, you know, whether it's water, gas, uh, a telco. You want to know where your assets are because it's a big problem. They've been buried years ago and people that knew where they are buried are gone. And then you want to locate them. So you can use an underground locator again directly in as we RG collector for RGIS, RGIS collector, I'm sorry for the new name, and just map this in real time in the field with a push of a button. And some AC use cases, for example, on the left, we have one of our customers in Colorado, DDSI, that used, was an early adopter of the EOS laser workflow into uh, RGIS, into the construction uh, work that they're doing over there. On the right, it was an impossible to realize project, building of a golf course, as you can see in the picture. And nobody believed that this could be done. And they took everything from the design to the implementation to the stakeout and to the as-built for golf course in an island uh, using RTK radios, UHF radios. And also some uh, other use cases, uh, for example, in Altagas, another customer in Alberta, Canada, that wanted to comply proactively with the uh, tracking and traceability standards. So they use high accuracy one centimeter hour receivers for the as building and doing all the construction work with that. Uh, other use cases again, environmental delineation on the left picture. And uh, 
On the right, you got, for example, drone uh, ground control point uh, using centimeter accuracy, where they can uh, they can have basically mosaic ortho photos being updated on a weekly basis and made available to managers, contractors, and, and inspectors. So takeaway messages for this is basically the big one is that you can do it yourself. Uh, you don't need to contract out to get one centimeter. It's not it's not that complicated. The one centimeter has been demystified. You can build your own data collection system uh, by choosing the platform, the, the computer platform that you want, whether it's you standardize on iOS, Android, or Windows tablets, and create get the software that you want and get the level of accuracy that is needed all in real time and do your work from A to Z. I'm going to transition now to Mike, uh, one of our partners, uh, uh, OHM advisors, and Mike can tell you what he does with his uh, receivers. So I'm going to kind of give you a background on uh, OHM, what we do, uh, some uh, best practices, some evaluations, some lessons learned, and then uh, kind of give you a background historical perspective on how we use uh, GPS receivers for various projects and show you some real world examples. Um, so OHM, uh, 16 offices across Michigan, Ohio, Tennessee. Uh, and then our disciplines, we have many disciplines, but GIS, we work with all of them. We're very integrated in the process. Uh, me, I'm the practice leader for GIS here at OHM. Uh, I oversee all GIS and innovative technology solutions for OHM. Uh, part of, I went to Michigan State University, go green. Uh, part of my job is to provide innovative solutions to my clients along with developing these solutions for internal purposes to help increase efficiencies for our staff. Really enjoy technology and here at OHM we like to push boundaries and think outside the box. So early adopters of new hardware or software. My goal today though is to inspire you and show you that thinking outside the box can be very beneficial to you and your company. So a little historical perspective. Uh, when I first started uh, seven years ago at OHM, uh, data collection was really on, only handled by our survey department, which was primarily a Trimble shop. Uh, they used uh, various survey devices like this tablet paired with an R10. Uh, once we started to build our GIS group though, we looked at different options for GPS uh, data collection solutions. And uh, as there are many shortcomings with the previous workflows, uh, which I'll get to in a minute. Uh, this handheld and its predecessors were really the only options that stood out to us at the time. Uh, purchased several of these devices uh, for many of our clients and ourselves. Um, we utilized Stirrasync, ArcPad on both those devices. Uh, some were connected to the MDOT core network, RTK network, while some were not. This also had some shortcomings. Uh, some data was filled out in the forms created within the apps. Uh, sometimes they were collected on paper, depending on the project. Uh, the, these devices had cameras built in, but the quality wasn't the greatest. Uh, so sometimes you also had to carry a separate camera. Uh, this all led to having to do massive amounts of wasted time and effort to do data transfer and conversion to our GIS post-processing. Uh, you know, billable hours equates to a lot of money being spent. Uh, so we had to look for other solutions. You know, as with most places, when you first ask to buy new expensive equipment, you should get told there's no more money. Uh, experiences at OHM and also with several clients. Uh, we have these units, let's make do with them until they break. Um, you know, this is where uh, I had to sharpen my pencil and make use, make a use case for ourselves and several of our clients. Just because we had these units didn't mean we had to use them. Several years ago at the time, those yellow bricks cost over 10K to get four inch accuracy. Again, not including the man hours on the back end to post process that data. With the rapid changes in, in uh, technological advancements going on, uh, there are now many choices of high precision GPS receivers on the market for under 10K for centimeter level accuracy. So I performed a cost benefit analysis. I looked at the following things, the time it took to turn the unit on, acquire the accuracy desired, capture a point, take the time to input the data into the forms, how much training was required to teach non-GIS users how to use that equipment and the software, how much time it took to download and post-process the data in order to get it back into the GIS. Now, I found it was, it was about two to three times more effort, which equates to a lot of money to collect the same data just three or four years ago. By spending a little upfront now, if you can, it'll pay itself off very, very quickly. Plus not to mention that instead of using those yellow bricks as paperweights, you could also trade them in and or sell them to recoup some of those extra funds. With technology ever changing, I like to follow, fo I like to follow what the great Bruce Lee is famous for saying, be water. Each, each year come budget time, right about now, you should be performing an evaluation on your hardware, software, and staff. You should be asking yourself, 
What are my existing software and hardware solutions? How, are, how am I deploying these solutions? What other hardware and software solutions have come out recently? How could I deploy these solutions? More importantly, will these solutions save time and money for me and my clients? Do I have the appropriate staff on my team? Are they in the right roles? Do they have the opportunity to do what they do best? Are, the, are my staying, staff trained properly? You have to keep up with the technology and industry and keep, up, keep your staff informed of the newest tools out there or else you get passed by your competition really quickly. That's why you have to be water. Like Tony Stark is saying right here, most of the world is unfortunately shut down and many of us are working from home. With the current situation going on, those of us that are fortunate enough to still be working, we need to be extra sharp on spending and coming up with new innovative ways of operating. Many of our clients are tightening budgets, cutting projects. In order to continue landing those jobs, we have to find solutions that work for everyone. Another way of accomplishing this is to find solutions that improve your efficiencies from the field and office. Keeping our client staff working is very important to a lot of our agency. We've been trying to find ways of doing uh, that by having them go out and do some field data collection, GPS structures, signs, meters, whatever. This is a prime opportunity to present them with a new GNSS GPS solution that makes sense for them for the long term. Collect it once with confidence and never have to do it again. Also talking to them about asset management, how it's very important to start tracking any work performed on these various assets. This can be done through a GIS or a CMMS software solution. Like I mentioned, earlier. Each year, right about this time of year, I do my own evaluation of various vendors for both hardware and software. Although it's nice to just go back and repeat customers, be a repeat customer with the vendor of your choice due to maybe a relationship or various discounts that they might claim to provide, you still have to do your research, especially with how rapid technology changes. You won't know if a better solution exists if you don't look. When you find a solution, Make sure you demo it firsthand. See how it works for you and your organization. Do the whole workflow from start to finish. When I did this three or four years ago, it changed everything that we do. We are much more technologically advanced and we are using new solutions each year regardless of the vendor. This has allowed us to stand out from our competition and land those jobs that we were fighting so hard back then. I'll now show you what we are currently using. Uh, we've tried multiple data collection software over the years, but ArcGIS Online has really set itself out from the rest. Uh, they have really done a great job of creating out-of-the-box solutions that meet pretty much every need for every industry. We operate a full enterprise deployment along with ArcGIS Online. Uh, this allows us to uh, create data collection apps and custom forms uh, using Collector, Survey123, Quick Capture, Workforce for ArcGIS, among others. We can also create slick operations dashboards that sit behind the scenes, allowing us to manage and oversee all of our field operations. By having it all connected in a cloud-based environment, it allows us for increased efficiencies in data collection and processing. A lot of our data feeds directly from our GIS into AutoCAD Civil 3D or MicroStation for our engineers and staff to work off of as well. Deploying these solutions like this is super easy for our clients as well. We work directly with them, creating custom solutions for their needs. Uh, at OHM from the field data collection side, we've demoed and tested several GPS units from the past over the past few years from all the major players. The unit that really has won out so far is the EOS Aero series. Uh, we operate several dozen Aero Gold units across our 16 offices. And with the advancement of mobile GIS apps like Collector, we're able to acquire centimeter, centimeter level accuracy horizontal and vertically, usually within a minute. Uh, we connect our devices we connect it to a device, either the Samsung Galaxy Tab S6 or an iPad uh, with Verizon LTE built in. This allows us to connect to the MDOT core station and collect live real-time points directly back into our enterprise. Training new staff is a breeze with a simple few button clicks of operation. And uh, we've even developed a small one-sheet troubleshoot guide for field staff and clients. There's not much that can go, go wrong when you use these units. What I love about this uh, of what we use with the Aero Gold units for a variety of projects, uh, which I'll show you here in a minute, but we've connected to them uh, traditionally with a rod bipod, but also attach them to our OHM smart bike for trail assessments, a vehicle for tracking, a backpack mount for wetland delineations, connected to the new EOS locate system that JY mentioned earlier for underground locating. This last one really gets me super excited. Um, so now a few actual practical examples. Uh, we went under contract with Oakland County here in Michigan, and uh, we were hired to map out all their uh, campus utilities, which included water, sanitary, storm, gas, power, telecom, which was copper and fiber, CCTV, and steam tunnels. Originally, we were going to use their as-built drawings and associated CAD drawings to attempt to locate all their assets. Uh, we would have brought along our trusty metal detector, our witch and sticks, probes, to help, all, help us locate these assets. The goal is to update all of their utilities and GIS for their field staff to use with their asset management program. Uh, once the project gets started, though, we thought there had to be a better way. We thought uh, we were going to use our EOS Gold units regardless, and then uh, we heard about the EOS Locate program. We decided to give it a try. 
we demoed the hardware and software and it proved to be the right solution for us. What it allows you to do is hook up, hook, is hook up like a tradi traditional utility locate to the tracer wire or metal pipe itself. Uh, then the transmitter seen over on the top left of the wall uh, sends a signal down through the tracer wire or through the pipe and the receiver seen in his hand detects the signal and gives us depth. Pairing this with an arrow gold, uh, both units talk to the phone or tablet and utilizing EOS Locate, we're able to capture a precise 3D point of the asset below ground uh, using a uh, collector. This can be easily exported out to Civil 3D as a 3D network. You know, this is a game changer. This saves so much time. Uh, here in, is an example of uh, the dash line being the record plan line. So as you see, it, it bends through the middle. And then the, uh, the solid line is our EOS Locate. And then the pink would have been the schematic, so our setup point, and our, we know there's a downstream over here. Had we not had locate, we wouldn't have known exactly where that path was. Uh, but what's not being seen here is that there's this giant old oak tree right smack dab in the middle. Uh, so by using locate, we were able to accurately measure the, and record the location of the gas main as it bent down and around the tree. Uh, here is a different location showing the same data as a 3D profile of several different assets in one location. Yellow at the top is CCTV, blue is copper fiber, red is electric, orange is gas. Look at the varying elevations as it goes along the line as it's buried, both up and down and left and right. You can see, this is actually a 3D view export, uh, but you can see all the different variations of the, the line as it was, it was laid down. So why is this a game changer? Now, traditional locating like this guy, he visits the site, locates the utility, paints it on the ground with a depth, like seen here, we've all seen this. You know? Then a two or three man survey crew might come back through and survey it in and records the depth along location. That then gets converted to a pointer line then might go into a CAD program. Then maybe, big maybe, it might come to, back to me, the GIS guy, to actually update their GIS. Using EOS Locate, you visit the site once, get it accurately uh, pinpointed, and then you capture it with one click and it's the same style locator, but it goes directly into your GIS as a 3D network at once. Once in the GIS, we can easily export it to Civil 3D or MicroStation for as-built purposes. By using Locate, we were literally able to knock out our locating for that project in half of the time we originally planned for. And if we were to have used a Locate service, this process is about a third of the time because there's only one person really touching that data versus two to three different sets of workers touching that same piece of data. So using Locate uh, for Oakland County was a goal to locate the assets, but their ultimate goal was to get it into a 3D uh, augmented reality system like VGIS. Um, uh, what, what this allows you to do is use a tablet phone, maybe a HoloLens to see where the assets are underground as if they were actually exposed. Um, did I mention that EOS actually works with the VGIS itself so you can actually locate those same assets with center, centimeter level accuracy when you're relocating those same assets. Imagine being able to use a system like this to go out and do your MISTIG. You're going to be able to see that right away and, and accurately map it out to uh, prohibit any potential utility strikes. Uh, another project, uh, due to the Flint water crisis here in Michigan that many of us has heard about, the state of Michigan uh, enacted a strict new lead and copper rule that went into effect June 14th of 2018. Very complex rule, but basically by the year 2041, every municipal government must remove any line that contains or ever contain any lead or galvanized pipe from the system. This includes a public and private side. The water service line is a line that comes from your water main all the way through your shutoff box and into your house. The first step, we had to do a desktop inventory looking at plans and tap cards to potentially map out the different uh, materials. The goal is to figure out what's under the ground, where it is. Uh, this will help in the field verification step, which includes potholing, where we drill a hole on both sides of the shutoff box and, and accurately map out uh, what the material is. And then when we're on site, uh, we GPS the curb shutoff boxes and then mark with a form uh, both public and private side of the line. This inf information was critical for future site visits to remove the service lines. Um, we then created a map showing all the different assets with the material types. Red is lead, red is bad. We needed them all to be green, for example. Uh, we created a map operations dashboard on the back end for uh, city staff and our team, and then a public story map for the public to find information about the project. But the ultimate goal is to get the lead out of the system. Um, another example, on May 20th, 2020, two dams failed here in mid-Michigan, which sent 38-foot waves rushing down the Titabossi River towards the city of Midland. There were, t there were areas that were under nine feet of water. This was actually their second 1,000-year flood in a few years. As a consultant for the county and the city of Midland, we were dispatched uh, to survey and inventory several different things. 
one of which included a very popular rail to trail called uh, the Pierre Marquette Rail Trail, seen here. Uh, time was of the essence to map out all of the damage, so instead of walking several miles of this trail um, or other sites, we dispatched our OHM smart bike, which was equipped with an EOS Aerogold GPS, it was specially mounted to the bike, and it was paired to our tablet running collector for our GIS. We had a second guy uh, mapping along with myself, utilizing an Aerogold attached to a backpack mount, as seen here. Uh, we mapped everything out from location of washouts in the concrete or asphalt, debris on or next to the trail uh, that needed to be removed, structures along the trail that needed repair. Here are a few of my images. This was directly downstream of uh, the, the blowout. Uh, a lot of damage, a lot of destruction. It was gnarly. Um, this all ended up with us being able to traverse many miles of trail in a very short amount of time, capturing high quality data as seen here along the way. Our engineers on the back end were able to see our points and pictures live which allowed them to get working on solutions to fix the, fix the issues at hand as soon as possible. By thinking outside of the box, we were able to create an innovative solution that allowed us to effectively and efficiently map out the da damage to help the local community. Here are a few other uses that we use our smart bike in, all of which were equipped with an arrow gold for high precision data collection. We've used, it to, uh, we've used the bike multiple times to map out non-motorized trails for ratings and assessments, trail mapping for parks, location of assets and signs, um, along the way. Uh, it's, it's proved to be very successful and uh, cost-effective uh, for many purposes. How about uh, large-scale data collection efforts coming up? Here are a few uh, jobs that we equipped our field staff with EOS kits to go out and capture thousands of culverts in a few different counties. We've done this all around the state, but here are two examples. A lot of data collected really fast. How about ADA inspections? Here's a community that wanted to evaluate all potential ADA violations within their community. This data was directly tied into their asset management system where they were able to evaluate our inspections and prioritize rehab to bring them up to code. So each one of these locations are centimeter level accurate where if they need to revisit the site, they can find it right away without potential uh, confusion as many sites you can see overlap each other. Do you perform laser scanning? On projects where we need to scan, uh, where we need our scans to be geolocated with control points, you can use an EOS Aero Gold to capture your control points. Whether you are using tradi traditional scanners like up in the top left, a mobile scanner in the middle, or a drone equipped with a scanner in the top right, using an Aero Gold can prove to be much more efficient for that data capture process. Here's an example of an ADA assessment we did it at an intersection. Uh, we tested the EOS with our traditional survey markers as seen here in the picture. Um, and our EOS units came back to be within a hundredths of an inch, which was super tight. What about thermal infrared flights from your drone? Here's one of our drone flights where we shot infrared, and you can see the before and the after looking for delamination of the asphalt. Here in Michigan, in the wintertime, these turn, often turn into potholes. So finding these sites and repairing them are crucial for our clients. By using an Aero Gold, we were able to precisely map these locations for our clients to, to revisit for rehab and repair. As you can see, there's a lot of things you can do to map things out differently. I hope that I've inspired a few of you to look at how you use high precision GNSS GPS receivers to effectively and efficiently map your spaces out. Again, be water with technology. The end. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Michael and Jean Eats. Uh, we have about 10 minutes for questions and some wonderful questions popped up, uh, two of which I wanted to ask myself. So um, John S. asks, uh, well, uh, this is uh, for, for Michael or both of you, did the operators of the EOS locate need additional utility training to cover liability requirements? Yes, um, we were not, we were just using it for location um, information. Um, we were not pretending to be Mystic uh, for our purposes. Uh, so we were just uh, mapping it to update the GIS and then for them to use and potential relocating of those assets. Um, in my specific example, um, if you're going out there and uh, trying to be mistaken and use this technology, um, I would think that you would need to acquire special certification and training to do so. Okay, and the, uh, the locate, the device that you've connected to with locate, that's geomagnetic, right? But conceivably, uh, probably maybe you have customers that have already paired up with say you know the little uh, lawnmower style GPR and uh, or sonic yeah in those cases you would run your GPR and then come back with an EOS behind the scenes and, and map those locations out okay um, those are not tied into the locate yet 
Okay, uh, a question, uh, question uh, an, a real-time network operator is asking, and of course I've experimented with this, wondering if EOS receivers can transmit raw data streams through NTRIP to uh, real-time network software. Have you had any applications of this uh, so far, John Eves? Yes, yes, uh, we do. There is a, there's a couple of formats that you can transfer to an RT, a real-time network, an RTK system. Some of them will just take the raw data, raw, me raw measurements, and make the computation themselves, or to some others, or the same one. You can also simply feed the what they call the RTCM corrections computed by the receiver themselves. And we saw we have to support uh, the latest formats, for example, the MSM new RTCM formats, MSM4 or PLUS, uh, they give you access to all the frequencies and all the constellations because we're not just, when we're talking about centimeter, now the, with the evolution of GPS constellation, we have not just L1 frequency and L2, but we have you know, L2C coming up, we have L5 also, and you're looking at, for example, B2, B1, B2, B3, you got Galileo, multiple frequencies. So all these messages now need to go through a stream. So they refined, if you want, the RTCM and made it more suitable for GNSS. So yes, we do support this. Okay, yeah, I, I've taken in, uh, you know, RTCM 3.2, MSM5, and that had everything that I could handle. Um, <laughs> we have... <laughs> Another question, um, do you believe that the price point for centimeter level accuracy solution is going to eventually be under 1K? Uh, it used to be 80K, so I can't say anything more about this. And it's come down, you know, to below 10K now, made you know, very affordable, but will it go down to 1K? Yeah, you might have chips that's now available that are two frequencies and available for very low price, but what performance do you get out of them? There's the automotive industry going on, trying to get down to higher accuracy, and but all the, the, the knowledge and thoughts and algorithms being put in how you make a GNSS receiver behaves under tough conditions of being reliable, being robust, giving you really that one centimeter that you're looking for to maximize accuracy requires some knowledge, not just mass production of a hardware, but also a lot of, if you want, IP into there. So there was a price associated with that, the performance and reliability compared um, to mass market production. And if we're looking at, for example, they mentioned the Trimble Catalyst. Okay, Trimble Catalyst is a high end, I would consider it being a high end receiver. And it's not below 1K. Yeah, the purchase of the hardware is 1K, but you're gonna service. So for the casual for the casual user that wants to get an on demand, it's a very good solution. In the long term, you know, if you use it every single day for five years, you'll end up paying, you know, the price of eight receivers if you want over five I, years. I will also so, add to that. Uh, JY, you know, I have a few of those receivers myself as well, and we demoed it and tried it. Um, one of the, the downcomings of that is that you're hardwired in. So you have a hardwire coming from your receiver down into your phone or your tablet. When you're doing wetland delineations, going through woods or anything like that, those cables often get disconnected and you're wasting time trying to reconnect. The Bluetooth, like in the Aero Gold, is phenomenal. There's no issues of disconnecting or anything like that. Right. The, uh, you know, people don't understand typically that you have to do the uh, digital to analog, uh, analog to digital uh, conversion. And you can do that up in the antenna, but to get it to the receiver. So, you're, you know, the system that you the build your own, your, your guys' example, uh, you know, that's definitely handled. And people are going to pay for the, well, there's a lot of gray matter that has to go into the, um, mixing and matching of, of satellites and signals, it is not as easy as people think. Uh, yeah, as a network operator, I have to model individual receivers and antennas to get them to integrate in in the noise models. So the $1,000 uh, system, um, I, don't, I don't think it's here very quickly. But, uh, and there is a market for that. I mean, if you look at the, the there's a market for the occasional user, and this is why Trimble has this software receiver. And they also have their regular receivers that are full hardware in the field where the processing is done on the receiver with their other models. So, yeah, there is, uh, there, this is different uh, market, if you want, or different types of users. Uh, but the price below 1K might happen, but probably not tomorrow, immediately tomorrow. In, the future tomorrow, maybe. <laughs>
and for the IoT type, uh, the the outfits that want to make smart roadside, um, uh, you know, like the barriers and for the Vito X for autonomous, they really need to get down below a thousand. But that could be a very controlled condition where they only need certain signals, and it could be scaled down to that. That doesn't. It's not a moving system. So right. a final question here for the time um, from Mariam K says, uh, can we imply the mentioned cases for making an inventory of roadside, asset, roadside assets using LIDAR? I can answer that one. Yeah. So uh, we usually use LIDAR and aerial imagery to potentially locate assets, and then we dispatch our crews out there to verify and collect the locations. But oftentimes, you need to collect the invert of the storm culvert, for example, and you cannot get that off of uh, LIDAR. You might be able to get the top of the pipe, but you don't know if it's a 12-inch pipe or a 36-inch pipe. You're only getting that top elevation. You're not getting the, 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 the invert. And then also doing your basic assessment is the, the pipe collapse. Is it damaged? Because uh, not all pipes discharge at the bottom of a ditch. Some are midway up a ditch. Some are at the top of the ditch. So you have to put eyes on your, your assets if you're truly trying to do a, an inventory of your system. Uh, mobile LIDAR is the same. You can maybe find uh, rims if they're visible in the roadway or in their immediate path, but if they're in that right away in that tall grass or behind a car, you're not going to be able to locate it and, and do that assessment on your system. Excellent. Yeah, you need the, uh, the expert, uh, the authoritative uh, position uh, and uh, validating it and the reporting systems, you know, that centimeter position and a timestamp and proving that somebody actually laid hands on it is important so gentlemen uh thank you for the wonderful presentations you you uh presented the bring your own device um uh the option or actually it's becoming the standard uh there's people often said you know oh i like the uh, all-in-one handheld the disadvantage is, is things are moving so fast that you're locked in with the bring your own when there's an advance in one of those four areas you've discussed you can upgrade that part yeah. so that's wonderful well, I also want to thank EOS, uh, EOS Positioning for sponsoring this event as well. So, gentlemen, thank you very much.